We are now set to begin in earnest our study of stochastic processes. In this lecture, we're going to motivate what that might mean and why we want to study those kinds of objects. It's rooted in a more realistic attempt to understand dynamics. So what is dynamics? What are dynamical systems? Well, let me give you a very brief and superficial description of what dynamical systems are. There are basically two kinds of dynamical systems that are very closely interconnected, discrete dynamical systems and continuous dynamical systems. In a discrete dynamical system, you have a state space, S, some particular fixed starting point in that state space, x0, and a function, f, from the state space to itself, which mediates the dynamics. And what does it mean to study the dynamics? It means that you're studying the sequence xn, which is defined iteratively by applying f. So you start at x0, and then you apply f to get f at x0, that's x1. Then x2 is f at x1, which is f at f at x0. And so, in other words, discrete dynamics is the understanding of arbitrary compositions of functions with themselves on a state space S. Of course, there's a lot that goes into trying to understand that. And then there are continuous dynamical systems, which have some of the similar constructs and some that might look a little bit different. If we have a state space S here, in this case, usually that state space is going to be Euclidean space or an open set in Euclidean space, or perhaps more generally a manifold. You have a base point x0 where you're going to start in S, and you have a function or more generally a vector field from S to S. If you're in the manifold context, then really it's going to take values in the tangent bundle of the manifold, but let's not worry about that. And in this case, what we're interested in studying is not the behavior of a sequence, but rather of a curve, x of t, which is an integral curve of that vector field. That is, it is a solution of the ODE, ddt of x is equal to f at x, starting at initial point x0. Now, there's a ton of extra structure and generalizations of these that one could study if one wanted, although there's already plenty of complicated math to do in these systems. But I want to point out from our perspective that both of these are unrealistic dynamical systems for anything in the real world because they're completely deterministic. That is to say, in both cases, if you know the starting point and you know the dynamical function f, then in principle, you know the behavior of the sequence or of the curve for all time afterward. Now, in practice, that may be very hard to actually say anything quantitative about because of chaos, that is, extremely sensitive dependence on initial conditions, which you can get in both these cases if f is not a really nice, say, linear function. That means that if you are at all uncertain about what x0 is, if you only know it to four decimal places, then after enough iterations or after enough time flowing in the ODE, you won't actually know to any degree of accuracy what the solution is. So we'd really like to understand what we can say about these things if we have measurement error. More generally, we'd like to model dynamics where there's random effects. There's some random noise that comes in in addition to the overwhelming deterministic evolution that you get from the deterministic function f. So how can we model that? How can we model a dynamical system with noise and or measurement error? We're going to stick to the discrete case as we motivate how we might do this, although I should mention, and hopefully we'll have time to come back to this later, we'll be able to say some things about a random continuous dynamics as well, using the same tools that we're about to start developing. So in the discrete case, one sort of general scheme we might use is to say, let's take the same framework. We have a state space and an initial point x0, and we're going to iterate some function f, except that now that function f might be a noisy function. And so although we expect it to have some sort of overarching expected behavior, at each time we apply it, it's actually a random function, fn there. 
Now, if we want to say anything meaningful, we're going to have to say in what sense is fn a random function, because this is just too vague and broad a setup in order to get any meaningful analysis out. So here is the more precise model of random function that we're going to use here for our discrete random dynamical systems. We'll have a background probability space, omega fp, and we'll have a, another auxiliary measurable space I'll call Rg. And living on that auxiliary space, we'll have a sequence of iid random variables, xn. This is going to be our noise. Now, we might not know much about the distribution of those, but we're going to assume that they're independent and identically distributed, which is basically just to say that whatever happens in the dynamics step by step doesn't affect in any way what the noise looks like. Now, we'll still have our state space S, where all of the dynamical action is going on, but we're going to make it a measurable space now because we know that our functions are going to be pretty rough when we add some noise, and so we'll have to deal with measurable functions, not continuous ones. And our dynamics is going to be mediated by a function f, like before from s to s, but it's going to be allowed to have random input. That is, it's a function of two variables, both the state space variable and the auxiliary random input variable where the xians live, and then take values in s. It's going to have to be a measurable function in order for all of this to work, so that is measurable with respect to the product sigma field b times g and the sigma field b in the range. And our dynamical system then is going to be a sequence of points in s, but they're going to be random points in s. So in fact, they're going to be s-valued random variables, xn, which are determined by the same kind of iteration that we did before. xn plus 1 is f at xn, but there's the random noise input as well, so that will be xn plus 1 with some initial starting point, x0, which will also allow to be a random variable. So measurable between those spaces. But let's make it independent from the noise. Again, so that the noise is not really affected and does not affect where we start. But it can, of course, affect where we go. So that's going to be our specific model for what we mean by a random dynamic function here. In other words, our random dynamic function fn has the form f of a variable x with auxiliary input xn plus 1, where these xns are iid. That independence of those xns is going to tell us a lot about how this evolution here, random though it is, is constrained and we'll actually be able to understand a beautiful, rich theory of these kinds of random dynamical systems to see how we're going to develop a basic property that they share right now that's going to power everything. So let's get there by rewriting this equation, iterating it over and over. If it weren't for this, we would just have that xn plus 1 is f composed with f composed with f, etc., n plus 1 times at x0. But with this in there, well, let's do one iteration. xn is equal to f of xn minus 1 and xn. Now, xn minus 1 is f of xn minus 2 and xn minus 1. So if we continue this down the line, what we see is that xn is some function capital Fn of x0 and xc1, xc2, up to xn, where that function capital Fn, it takes the state space, this variable here, and n copies of the random auxiliary state space r, and spits out something in s. And that function fn of those variables x and y1 through yn takes the form, well, we are doing the composition f composed with f composed with f, etc. But f is a two variable function, so how do we do that? Well, we take f of x and y1 and then input that to the x variable of f with y2 in the y variable, and so on. So that's our function that's mediating the dynamics in an increasing number of variables, if you like.
And the thing that I want you to note about this is that this capital Fn is a measurable function of the product sigma field b times g to the n into b. And showing that from here is a simple induction argument. So what this particular model of random dynamics tells us is that the xn is determined by the x0 together with the input of the first n random noise variables. Now another way of saying that, which follows directly from this representation, is that if we look at the sigma field generated by the random variables x0 through xn, that's the same as the sigma field generated by x0 together with just the c1 through cn, right from here. That's the easy direction of the dube dinkin representation theorem. And just for a little bit of notation I'll ease here, let's note that f0 is going to denote the sigma field just generated by x0. Now here is a key observation. cn plus 1 is independent from this whole sigma field here that we called fn. That's because cn plus 1 is independent from all of these, these were an iid sequence, and we assume that the starting point was independent of the whole sequence as well. And so by the grouping lemma, we get that cn plus 1 is independent from fn. So what happens if we condition on this sigma field? That is, we condition on the random variables x0 up to xn. Condition what? Well, let's take an arbitrary bounded function of our point xn plus 1 after n plus 1 steps of evolution. g of xn plus 1 conditioned on fn. Well, xn plus 1 is just little f of xn and cn plus 1. And so we're conditioning this function, g composed with f, of these two variables, xn and cn plus 1, on fn we know how to evaluate that conditional expectation because this variable is independent of that sigma field. As we showed several lectures ago, that means that we can evaluate this just by taking the regular old scalar valued expectation of the function g composed with f at variable x and random variable cn plus 1. That gives me a number for each little x and we evaluate that number at little x is equal to capital Xn. That's how we evaluate the conditional expectation here. And in particular, we note that that means that this is a function of Xn. So that's quite remarkable because we were conditioning on x0 through Xn, all of the previous random variables, and we're getting just a function of Xn. But in fact, it's not really that surprising. It just comes from our observation that we made right here that all of these random variables here are determined by x0 together with some random noise that we're sort of integrating out here. Let's be even more precise. There is an associated probability kernel here that we get from this formula. If I take for my fixed dynamic function f and for any input point in the state space x, qn of x and a set b to be this law, this measure at b, that is the law of the random variable xn inputs to f of x and xn. That gives me for each x a probability measure, and that is a probability kernel. That probability kernel has a Markov generator, which you get just by integrating a bounded measurable function against this measure to give out a function of x. Now, in fact, what we've got written right here, just by the change of variables theorem, is just such an integral. It's the integral of, say, g of y against the law of f at x and xn, which is just what we defined to be the probability kernel, this time indexed by n plus 1, of x and dy. And so that is, by definition of the Markov generator, ln plus 1 applied to g evaluated at xn. So that's an even more concise way to describe the function that this conditional expectation is of xn. Now let's take this one step further. We've shown that for any bounded function g, g of xn plus 1 conditioned on fn, which means conditioned on all the previous random variables 
in the dynamical system x0 through xn is this nice function of xn described in terms of a Markov generator applied to the bounded function g. That's a function of xn and so it is measurable with respect to the sigma field generated by xn. It's also a bounded function because it's in the range of a Markov generator circa the last lecture. So this is in the bounded functions on omega measurable with respect to the sigma field generated by x alone. Even though in defining it, we conditioned on all of the xk up to xn. So that means that if I further condition this, that is this, on this sigma field, it won't change by the tower property. But what happens if I condition this on the sigma field generated by xn? Well, let's just check. What's the conditional expectation given xn of this? Well, sigma of xn is a sub-sigma field of fn, which is the sigma field generated by xn and some other stuff. So by the tower property of conditional expectation, that's just the conditional expectation of g of xn plus 1 given xn alone, almost surely. And again, that's just because sigma of xn is contained in fn and the tower property for conditional expectation. Whereas this already measurable with respect to xn if further conditioned on sigma of xn isn't actually further conditioned at all. We just get the same thing back. But that is equal to this conditional expectation on the larger sigma field. So what have we done? With this particular model of random noisy dynamics, we have shown that for any bounded function of our process, if I condition it on all of the previous iterations, that gives me just the conditioning of it on the immediately previous iteration. That is, conditioned on the whole past of this dynamical system, the value is the same as conditioned on what happened just one instant ago. This process is memoryless. After each step, it forgets everything that happened before and only remembers what happened in the last instant. Now, we can state this more generally if we go through this same argument again, being a little more careful, we can get this more general property here that if I take g of xn and condition it on fk for any k less than n, so all of the random variables up to time k where k is less than n, then that will be the same as conditioning on just the endpoint xk. So it's a more general property. It says that the process here is memoryless, conditioned on the past up to some time. It only remembers what happened at that time. And you can get that just by taking the same arguments we did here and noting that the conditional expectation of g of xn given fk by an induction argument is going to be ln, ln minus 1, down to lk plus 1 of g applied to xk, and then condition the same way we did in order to get this. This property, or even in this special form, is called the Markov property. And it is the bread and butter of how we will actually analyze these kinds of random dynamical systems. So that leads our way into our discussion of stochastic processes, and in particular, Markov processes, which are going to satisfy a version of this property.